Um, good morning, everybody. A very warm welcome to you all joining us today at our Thoughtful Thursday session. So for anybody who doesn't know us, we are Irish in Britain and we're a membership organisation supporting the work and the growth of a network of Irish organisations throughout Britain. My name is Ashling. I'll be hosting today's session. Um, before I hand over to my colleague and our speaker for today, I'm just going to run through some housekeeping. So just to let everybody know that this session is being recorded and it will be uploaded onto our website as a learning resource. Um, participants are on mute, so they can't speak and also your cameras are off. But we have both a, um, on the bottom of the screen there, we have both a chat box and a Q&A box. So if anybody wants to uh, make any contributions or if you have any questions, then please do post them in either of those boxes and I will be in the background monitoring that throughout. We will hold some space in the session for questions and answers, so please do put anything in there. Um, if anybody um, joining us today doesn't wish to be contacted about any future sessions, then you can just let me know in the chat or you can send me an email. I'll drop my email into the chat in a moment. And I think for housekeeping, that's all. So what I will do now is hand over to Zibby. Zibby is our Quivna coordinator and she will speak briefly and then she'll introduce our speaker for today. All right. Thank you, Ashling. Good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome to our thoughtful Thursday session today, organised by the Quivna team at Irish in Britain. Quivna is an Irish word, it means memory, and we um, this is part of a series of sessions where we are inviting people to share reminiscence and reflections on different aspects of Irish and um, recent Irish history to support the work that we do around um, memory and memory, memory loss and dementia. Um, we warmly welcome everybody. Um, if you're new to Irish in Britain, please do um, follow up the message in the chat about how to find out more about what we do and we welcome new members. Mm -hmm. um, I'm delighted today to welcome Alton Cowley, who's kindly coming to talk today to share his reflections and reminiscence about um, the work that he's been doing um, researching people's experiences in the, in the construction industry. Alton is a um, historian, he's a writer, and he's published a book, um, The Men Who Built Britain, The History of the Irish Navy, which he'll be talking about. And he's also very interested in using music and imagery in exciting ways to bring um, memories to life and to share these. Um, he's produced also an audio documentary CD, Voices of the Men Who Built Britain. So I'm going to hand over to Utan now. Utan, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us how you became interested in this area of research? Thank you very much, Sibi. Uh, good morning, everybody. You're very welcome. I'm delighted to see some familiar faces. <laughs> well, I'm not seeing the faces, but I'm seeing the names. And uh, it's, it's, it's a terrific opportunity to, um, indeed, to refresh my own memories, which <laughs> uh, are getting a little bit uh, hazy. And in, in, in so I was surprised at things that I thought I, I would come readily to mind and didn't when I was preparing for this um, for this talk. Anyway, um, I, I, I'm happy to sort of bat this uh, topic backwards and forwards with uh, with the panelists, and um, we'll we'll sort of um, we'll take it from there. I think um, it was it was put to me as a um, a starter question, shall we say, was why was emigration so attractive to young Irish people, especially men in the fifties, sixties, and seventies, and um, the short answer, of course, is that uh, the, the, there's nothing here, as they used to say. When somebody go home after a period over in, uh, in, 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 in Britain to the home place, oh, where have you been? You were, oh, you were over, were you? You know, uh, uh, when you, uh, how long are you staying? When are you going back? And uh, a man might say, this would be in the 70s, maybe, when they'd made a few shillings and thought they'd look around for something to invest in in Ireland or get the start. And I thought I might find a bit of work here. And I like, oh, no, there's nothing here. There's nothing here. So nothing had changed, basically, over the two, three decades. Um, and uh, it wasn't just the lack of employment. It was the, uh, the almost the inevitability where you had... Um, uh, large families, uh, and, and as the saying was, the home nest could maintain but one and the hard road for the others, and that you would be taking the boat. It was almost um, taken for granted to the, to, to the extent that it wasn't even discussed. Uh, so uh, I think that might answer the question. And then the, 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 the lack of um, free secondary education, secondary schools were fee paying, and where you had large families, and, and uh, particularly in, in small holdings and so on, um, 
if the parents didn't have the resources to to pay for their children to get an education beyond the age of 14, that was that. Um, and 84% of the um, the immigrants who left in 1960 had left school before the age of 14. So I think that uh, answers the question of why, why they were so eager to leave. Um, there was also the possibility of escaping from um, the scrutiny of priests and parents and getting the handling of money. And the reports coming back suggested that um, the crack was going to be good in Cricklewood. So I take it from there, really. What sort of experiences did people have when they, they left and arrived in Britain? Why was um, construction such a popular industry to go into? Well, you see, in, in part, the, um, my, my um, reference to the education system and, and uh, the, the paucity of education, and that would have included um, uh, technical education, meant that they, uh, the men particularly uh, were not fitted for very much except uh, manual, unskilled manual labour. And that was in huge demand in post-war Britain and the, the era of reconstruction. And construction was very labour intensive and literally labour intensive in those years compared with what it is now. It wasn't mechanised to anything like the same extent. Um, you can't go onto a site today without having um, a safe site pass, just for starters. And after that, to operate any machinery, you have to have a ticket and you'd have a, a suite of tickets to, to get employment. That wasn't the case then. You showed up any fear of the start and... Uh, a ganger man would take a look at you if you had mud on your boots so you looked like you'd um, met with muck in the recent past, jump up on that wagon there. So uh, it was a ready opportunity and the groundworks in British construction were being largely dominated by, uh, by Irish uh, subcontractors. So uh, they were, you know, always ready to give, um, give their own the opportunity to, 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 uh, to give a day's work. Can you talk a bit more about what kinds of things people um, wore to do this kind of work? Did people have to supply their own um, clothes, boots, or was anything offered? Well, there was no workwear in, 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 in those years, and the, 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 uh, the photographs speak for themselves, really. Um, and it was the same, that was the, the same in, the, in, 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 in rural Ireland. Um, a farm labourer or a farmer, indeed. Everybody wore suits. That was the, the, the apparel. That's what you had. It was a suit. And you had the good suit for Sundays to go to mass, and um, when the point came where the sun, the, the suit was no longer good enough for for Sunday wear, it became um, daily work wear, and uh, so they had and 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 their 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 footwear was also um, just the standard um, street wear, uh, work boots as such, and certainly steel toe cap boots didn't exist in the sixties. The, the 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 ubiquitous donkey jacket came in, which was like a like a a serge uh, jacket with two big patch pockets uh, buttoned up the front and it had um, leather shoulder patches on it so that they, you know, the, the, the shoulders would be taking the hod or the tool and um, the fabric wouldn't wear as fast. So that was the, 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 the donkey jacket. Um, other than that, there was no, and, and men, men wore the same flat caps that was the trademark of, of uh, countrymen uh, throughout, throughout rural Ireland and they wore those on site as well and that's uh, that's what you see in the in the historic pictures. How did people go about finding work when they arrived in Britain? I mean, how how were people, um, how were jobs advertised, or how did how did people pick up jobs in construction? Well, the pub was the um, was the labour exchange, uh, and and that goes back to a nineteenth century tradition where the. Um, they, 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 you'd have the, 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 in the, before there were trade unions, in fact, when trade unions weren't even legal, um, tradesmen would congregate uh, amongst their own in, in a, so that's where you have um, the, the bricklayers' arms and the masons' arms and those kinds of names. So you, you go to, the, to, to a pub in a certain part of, uh, of, we say, London or Manchester or Birmingham, where you were, uh, through word of mouth, you were told, well, that's where, you know, the, the Irish drink and uh, you'd meet a, uh, a ganger man, a subby contractor, and um, you'd certainly be told where um, where there was the, the, the start, uh, you know, where, where where jobs were going on, and um, who might have the shout, as they say. Who has the shout here? Who is the man that can give you the start or not, as the case might be? Um, 
So they started pretty much from there. It was all word of mouth. Similarly with where they went when they left uh, and, and left Ireland to take the boat, you know. Uh, well, you go to Camden Town you, and uh, and they used to say that I was the furthest an Irishman could walk from Houston Station with two full suitcases. It was going from the known to the known, to use the, the well-worn academic phrase for this. You, 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 you were uh, tapping into the Irish networks and the Irish communities, and that applies in, in, in terms of work as well. Um, it might be useful, actually, to backtrack a little bit here, um, Ashling, if you possibly could, to play that um, that uh, little link from my CD, Voices of the Men Who Built Britain, please. Yeah, I absolutely will, Elton. I'll, I'll share that screen now, all right? Thank Let's say the 50s, 60s. It was unbelievable in England that time. It was like another invasion, I'd say. <laughs> Instead of Germans, you had paddies with shovels. And that's exactly how it was. As down the glen came McAlpine's men With their shovels slung behind them it was in the pub They drank their sup And down in the spike you'll find them they sweated blood and they washed down mud with pints and quarts of beer. And now we're on the road again with McAlpine's fuselier. At that time, everybody was leaving us, and yeah, people older than me, and I saw them going like, you know, as soon as I left school at 14, and before I left school at all, the only thing that was on my mind is go to England. Because I seen people older than me going to England and seen them coming back and... Which Christmas you know, time were you? Most of Christmas time at that time. And you were just waiting for the day that I would go myself. It's once in a lifetime that thing happened. When a multitude of Irishmen went to a place called Camden Town in Cricklewood. Hundreds of them. Between the ages of 16 and 40, between say 54, 55, up to 1970. There was no other work compared. I mean, there was buildings went on and there was power station went on. But there was no crowd of Irishmen that came together in one particular job. Strictly Irishmen, just west of Ireland men. Kerry, Connemara, Mayo, uh, Bell Mullet from different parts of Mayo, but 90% of the Bell Mullet, Arnmore Island, Widor, and Philcar in that area there. Hundreds of them, and thousands of them, every morning in Cricklewood, jumping on wagons. And it's a part to history now. I spent 20 years researching and recording these men's histories, and many of their stories have their roots in the simple but harsh phrase the home nest could maintain but one, and the hard road for the others. Nearly whole villages immigrated at a time. Mm -hmm. In my small village, seven or eight houses there, the leader of every house in the village went, the head of the family. It was the English pound note that kept you alive of the American dollar, you had nothing otherwise. So when your kids got old enough, like me, I was the oldest, after the sugar beet to send money home. My father was travelling abroad for 42 years. When Tony Nathan was going to England, I went in with him to town. And that time, would you believe it, there was um, the steam engines. And I can still hear that hissing sound. Easton's used to have a little place on the station that sold books. And we were just sitting down and I was looking at these books, a shilling, one and sixpence, which was a fortune for me at the time. And the people going up to the ticket counter and saying, Crew, Leicester, London, buying the tickets. Young fellas now, like, you know, with the suitcases and a belt around them and the labels on them and the parents with them and brothers and sisters and they in tears saying goodbye to them. I remember that one particular occasion, all like, it was a frightening scene because all engine then geared up you see and, and, and set off a, a booze of smoke up in the air and so on and you had this gloom after Christmas you know all bad dark weather you know jeez it was like Dante's hell
that's a very, very powerful, very evocative image there, I, I think. Um, uh, that was um, a man in, uh, in North Mayo uh, reminiscing about uh, the, the early 60s. And in, the, in West of Ireland in the 1960s, there was a joke circulating uh, about the um, uh, a religious instruction class in, in the local primary school somewhere in, in, in North Mayo. And the teacher says to, to, he says, tell me, Sean, who made the world? Sean jumps up and he says, McAlpine, sir. And my daddy laid the bricks. And uh, it was just um, the, the, folk, the folk wisdom of the time. And the, the, the ubiquity of, of construction in the... Uh, in the mythology of of the that time was uh, embedded in little uh, little doggerel verses that were written around it. Um, McAlpine went by motor car. George Wimpy went by train. But Paddy tramped the Great North Road, and he got there just the same. So come all you pincher kiddies and you long distance men, don't ever work for Wimpy, McAlpine, or John Lang, for they'll put you behind the mixer. You'll be dogging in the sand. And you'll rue the day you sailed away from Mary Horan's land. So it's uh, it's embedded in the culture, you know, culture of migration and uh, and 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 uh, getting the start in construction. Thank you, Elton. It's wonderful to also to hear um, people's voices as well. I'm going to bring in Mary Tilkey now, and um, Dr. Mary Tilkey, who's our patron of Quivner, to ask a question. Oh hi, Alton. That was that was a very moving clip, the moving music and, and a move, moving story there. You Thanks, mentioned Mary. you mentioned earlier about the sub subcrack. I can't even say it now. Subcontractors employing mm -hmm. uh, so employing good. predominantly Irish men. Well, almost exclusively Irish men. Mm. Um, and in the clip, they talk about people coming from Belmollet and Falcara and, you know, Connemara and places like that. They also, there was a tendency for those to go into particular sectors of the industry as well, weren't they? Like the Donegal well, men were, were great tunnelers. That's absolutely right. Yeah, the Donegal men have a reputation uh, to, to, to the point where they're known as the Tunnel Tigers and they still um, have a very uh, strong influence in the industry worldwide uh, mm -hmm. today. Hard rock tunneling particularly, it's very, very skilled work. But above all, it's it's interesting you should mention um, Bell Mullers and then Donegal, you know, Bell Mullers in North Mayo. And Mayo men uh, tended to be very prominent and still are in the construction industry. And... Um, extremely successful there's one there's one road in a little place called Bohola uh, not far from Castle Bar where it was said that there were six millionaires on the street or, or had originated on the same street all made their money in construction um, but the Donegal men were tunnel, tunnelers and tunnelling was teamwork and that's why what I'm coming at here is the distinction between the two the the entrepreneurial subcontractor the, 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 the man out to make money for himself um, was a certain uh, type and a certain breed, and the um, the tunnelers were team workers, and it, uh, you were as strong as your team was as strong as the weakest member, and so everybody had to be up to speed and up to scratch, and uh, it was a it was a very focused culture. They they were there to make money, and they were there to um, get out if they possibly could, as soon as they possibly could, and the the the, the, the famous. Uh, the homes of Donegal, as the song has it, were 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 lovely homes, but hard hard one. Um, and then, as I say, with the with the subcontractors, and then the Connemara were known as the heavy diggers, and they were big, strong, powerful men. Um, their only, um, I suppose, vulnerability was that many of them were were native speakers and didn't have, in in the early years, didn't have a great command of English, and they um, were therefore vulnerable to exploitation. Um, um, it within the industry uh, by their by their own. Mm. By the mm, very sad. Um, can you can you say why the pub was so important? You mentioned it was the labour exchange, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, but there was other it had another other functions as well. Well, it did absolutely. It was a, it was a social centre. Um, in in the early years, particularly, um, the, as I say, there was no workwear per se, so. Um, what you you worked in, what you stood up in, and you went back to your accommodation, back to the digs, uh, in the same um, workwear that you stood up in, and you so you were 
in all weathers, you know, well, um, no money if you stopped for the rain, as the song has it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you did, there was no getting uh, paid if, if you weren't out on site in, 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 in the wet weather. It would have to be extremely bad weather to stop work. Uh, so you were, you know, the landlady wouldn't give you the big hello. There was no television lounge, you know, and uh, where, where did you go? Well, if you were with the, if you were a day labourer um, on the lump, as they say, cash in hand, um, and, and you would be dropped off at the pub. You'd be hired at the pub, like the famous uh, hiring fairs were, play, uh, stands were places like uh, the Crown in Cricketwood and, and, and Broadway and uh, Hammersmith. And um, you got the start there. You jumped up on the wagon, as, as, as they, the phrase had it, uh, in, in the morning, seven, half seven in the morning, and you were gone all day. And if you brought back and you dropped off at the same place at the end of the day, if you were lucky, so in, in later years, there were some, um, yeah, bad instances where, you know, lads were simply left behind. But anyway, that's where you dropped off. And so you were amongst your own and you could socialise with them. And they used to say that, it, again, in the early years, the late 50s, um, there the, was the a little stove down at the, or a fire, uh, open fire down at the, 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 the bottom of the pub. And after uh, an hour or so, you could see the steam rising off the donkey jackets as, they, as the men dried out. And uh, they were amongst their own. They could socialise and they could also... Um, and, and were expected in many cases to buy the um, buy the ganger man drink, so that they would get the start the following morning. So uh, in in later years, then the pubs were often um, run by um, owned by the brewery, but run by by Irish um, publicans. Some of them might well be related to the contractors. And uh, when payment by check came in. Uh, they would act as an informal clearing house. So a man would go in on a Friday evening, he'd have a check for whatever it was, um, ten pound, fifteen pound, and he'd show the check to the to the the, the hooligan pudding and say, Well, there's a load of Reagan men up there already, uh, I'm paying them out. Um, you have to wait a little while, but here's here's a fiver to be going on with, you know. So the man then has a fiver in his hand, but he's still waiting to get the the, the balance. And uh, what does he do? He orders up a you know a pint for himself, and then he's he spent his fiver, and he's still waiting. And at the end of the night, then he gets the balance. He gets the tenner, less ten shillings um, uh, fee for uh, for for clearing the check for him. That kind of system. So that again made them uh, dependent on the pub. To say nothing else, I don't believe any man ever left Ireland as an alcoholic. I think they 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 it was endemic in the in the in the way of life. And uh, mm -hmm. there are other um, aspects to that um, that. Uh, the, one of the most um, informative and colourful of my um, interviewees was Noel O'Donnell, whom you heard there earlier on, uh, and you'll hear him again in, 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 a, in a clip later, uh, from, from Ross Muck in Connemara. And um, yeah, he, 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 he said that, you know, you, you, you would, um, you'd be out there and you'd be... You, Lost the sound. And um, you know, if, if you got too too fond of the drink, then you weren't able to perform, you weren't able to deliver the work. And so you'd start off, um, you'd be running, you, you, most of them, they saw themselves as running away from something, maybe the sense that they weren't uh, succeeding as they were had been expected to succeed. Um, so they, they took to the drink. And then you'd be running away from something, and then you'd be running away from yourself eventually when you found you couldn't do it. So you know, it, it's all it's built, built into the way of life and built into that that pub culture, and also the macho culture, um, where you were, um, where you were um, thought you were, you were more highly thought of if you were a big drinker than if you were a good worker. Mm -hmm. Again, mm -hmm. you know, this, this whole macho image, you know, and. Uh, um, a man called Joe McGarry described to me, you know, the way he, you see the young men going into the calves in the morning. And as he put it, um, they couldn't talk to an English person. They couldn't talk to a woman. They, 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 they were so, uh, they were so inhibited by the, uh, probably by the, the, the culture they actually grown up in, where you, you know, speak when you were spoken to and uh, don't ask questions. It means you don't know anything and all of that kind of culture here in Ireland. And um, they, they, they take to the drink. And he, as, as he put it, they'd knock each other down to prove that they weren't afraid. But they were always afraid of something. So it is a very, very mm -hmm. deep um, conflict. There, 
there, there was a kind of a, 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 a macho culture on the building sites as well. You were a great worker if you could, you know, build so many bricks in an hour or, you know, carry so many blocks in your hod and things like that. Yeah, Which or if you, has impacted on image when you're yeah. when you're older. A bag of cement on each shoulder and run with it. You know, these mm. are the big, big, big 25 kilo bags. Uh, that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, well, it's that's it's 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 what young men do, isn't it? You know, your your feats of strength and all of that. As De Valera put it, the contest of athletic youth. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. It comes back to haunt them later when they're not <laughs> able to do it any longer. It does very much so. Yeah, it's very well. I think isn't is it is it not the case, uh, Mary, that um, amongst the over sixties in 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 in, uh, the, in the Irish community in Britain today, there are two women for every man. Yeah, probably even more than that. Yeah, yeah. There you are. It speaks for itself, you know, as the construction industry was the largest single employer of Irish male migrant labour. In, in 1960, there were 200,000. And they were they were primarily concentrated in groundworks, which is to answer a, a previous question of yours. Why, what parts of construction? Well, yeah, I got off on the Tunnel Tigers. But mainly it was in uh, groundworks. It was in excavation, muck shifting. Um, yeah. Putting in the services, uh, laying, laying cable, you know, uh, a lot of the work in the immediate post-war period, uh, the opportunity were there for what they call cut and cover work, which was replacing the, um, the post office cable network and the, the water uh, networks and so on. And then um, bringing in um, North, sea, uh, North Sea oil and gas. And Murphy by that time was such a big contractor, he was the only one big enough to, 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 to reach across the entirety of Britain and bring the big spine mains down from, from the north of Scotland, right down through uh, the whole of Britain. And then um, he and others, uh, lesser subcontractors, would take those then into the cities and then ultimately into the into the houses. You can visualize this, you know, uh, as a vast seething um, industry uh, with, with lots of opportunity. Everybody started off down the trench. Some looked mm -hmm. up and said, there's money being made here. How is it being done? That's the difference. Mm -hmm. Now they yeah. might have had certain assets, like they might have a brother or two brothers. Um, uh, they, they might be just that little bit more ambitious, that little bit more edgy. And then they would have their enforcers if they got to that point where they were employing others. They'd have the, 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 the ganger men who would enforce um, the work ethic. And beyond that, then there'd be sharp practices. And this was uh, very widespread. And it's not just in 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 you know in, in that it, that part of the work that we're talking about the groundworks, but throughout the industry, uh, what they call dead men, um, you know, a subcontractor would take on to deliver a certain amount of, of work on a site, and he he would price it, and he'd say, well, I'm going to need twenty men to do that work. Um, and he'd do his best then to only employ fifteen and uh, draw draw money for the for the uh, the remaining uh, twenty. But his um, his um, estimator was very accurate in, in the, 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 uh, the, the labour that was going to be needed. So that um, shortfall of five men's labour was going to have to be taken out of the 15 who were on site. And the, the, um, the profit from that would be divided then between um, the contractor and the ganger man. And the lads would be told uh, on, on a big enough site where you had, say, men from different counties, you had Connemara men, you had Kerry men. And you'd have them uh, two gangs excavating uh, in different areas of the site, and the ganger man come up to the to the curry man. He say, "Jesus, as you're a bit slow this morning, look at them fellas in the west of the world. Look at them; they're, they're powering ahead there, you know." And the boys would whip off the jackets and they get stuck. And you go over to the other fellas and you say the same thing in your first <laughs> thing. <laughs> but they won't get paid any more at the end of it. You know, no. where, whereas it, it, it is it is it is. Um, widely uh, recognised that were they working for an English contract. They would all get a bonus. Mm, mm. Yeah, but they won't go to get that from Paddy. <laughs> Thank you, Elton. We've had a question um, in the chat um, mm. asking about whether, in your research, when you were talking to people about their experiences, was there um, many stories about exploitation? Um, did you find subcontractors ever exploiting workers for with low pay? Um, or did you find it, stories of people turning up in the pub and not being paid after their work? Did that happen or did you experience that with them? 
uh, not being paid would be uh, would be a rare event, I think. Uh, it, not saying it didn't happen, it did happen, but not in a systematic way, you know. And it would happen with probably very, very small uh, one, one man bands and so on. Um, and and uh, the rate was the rate. And if you were paid, you were paid the rate that you had agreed uh, with, with the uh, with the subby or whoever it was before you started. What you might not get would be, uh, you know, like as I say, a production bonus uh, and, and and so on. Um, you see, a lot of what you're going to well, the whole the whole point of 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 my work is that it's largely based on anecdotal evidence. And when I was starting out and to do this research in the in the very early nineties. Um, it was still the case in in, in, in academia and amongst historians um, that um, anecdotal evidence was highly suspect. And so if that was your, your field of endeavor, you really weren't at the races. Um, you know, you had to have your primary sources had to be in, in, in archives and uh, <laughs> repositories and this and that. And, you know, you go, go through enough of those and you suddenly like, yeah, you, you, you'd be you were legitimate. You'd be listened to. Um, but actually, we've come a long way from that now, and that is that's completely gone out the window. That and, and, and anecdotal evidence. You see, if that's all there is, but you talk to enough people and you keep being, if it, you know, keep being told the same stories, well, then you know you're getting told the truth. That's it. You know, if it if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it bloody well is a duck. <laughs> Whether your professor so and so likes that or not. Thank you. We've had another question in about um, trade unions, and I know you briefly mentioned uh -huh. that earlier. Um, and the question is whether trade unions recruited and organised workers within the construction industry, and um, whether there was every, any evidence, whether you've discovered people talking about um, the sort of the efforts to, to be organised by trade unions and the impact on people. You see, by and large, um, trade unions benefited tradesmen almost by definition, but not unskilled labourers. Um, and and uh, amongst the navvies, and there is some, um, there is some um, evidence for this based on uh, academic research, um, which I won't go into now, but, but um, he was a Scot who, who, who worked amongst navvies. He also worked amongst fishermen and he worked amongst coal miners um, in, in his uh, post-grad uh, research. And uh, he, the, the thing was that the the, the, the navi then and, and later the unskilled labourer didn't subscribe to trade unions. They didn't really want to know them. It was a lower form of life, and um, he didn't see that they were going to be able to do very much for him. You know, uh, his his bargaining power lay in um, going up to the site office if he didn't like the, the, the conditions or whatever. Didn't like the the, the ganger man, and he'd say, "This isn't the days when you got a, an insurance stamps." Uh, put into a little book, you see, and, and uh, you, you, the stamp would, would have had an adhesive on the back and that would be lick the stamp and stick it into the book. So he goes up to the side, obviously, say, lick them and stick them. And he'd take his, his, his stamp and his book and he'd walk off site, you know, out of the trench, put on the jacket, go down the road and get the start somewhere else because, you know, his, his, uh, his bargaining power was uh, his, his, his the, 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 the strength in his muscles, you know, and his staying power, his, his, his stamina. So that was his, uh, his, his bargaining ship. And that's the way they, they looked at it. And they were, there was a great ethic amongst the, especially in the older, um, what they used to call the, the, the pincher kiddies, the tramp navvies, um, which they inherited from the uh, 19th century railway navvies, British railway navvies, that you tramped from one job to another, as, as I said there. Um, Paddy tramped the Great North Road and he got there just the same. That goes back to the 19th century. So you walked from uh, site to site, from town to town, and uh, you got work through, uh, you, you got word of work through the um, uh, the model lodging houses and places like that. And, uh, you know, I hear so-and-so is uh, starting a site, uh, starting a job up in Newcastle or in Doncaster, or well, you'd head off there and you get there and, and you know, you might find this, the job was over or there was work going on somewhere else. So that, that was their bargaining power. And uh, they had a great um, sense of, um, independence and, and pride in themselves and in their work, uh, in their ability to work rather than the work itself, I think, because they often didn't know. And uh, Patrick McGill um, describes this when he comes off that uh, hydro um, 
dam in Kinloch Leven in Scotland in, in 19, 1912, was it? Um, thousands of them, as he as he describes it, walking off this down from the mountains, down from the highlands. And we didn't know what we what we were doing and why we were doing it, but we did it, you know, and uh, we, and then we moved on, that kind of thing. Um, the horizons in, 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 in the uh, mental horizon was limited. The physical horizon was limitless. Is that uh, any, any, any help? Yes, thank you. Can you talk a bit more about how people connected, um, um, men coming over from Ireland connected with people from the same regions of Ireland? So of course people migrated from Ireland from, from different counties, different places. How did people connect with each other um, when they arrived in, in London, for example? Um, what was, can you talk a bit more about social life? And... I suppose you had, you had the Irish centres you know, so the, the London Irish Centre in particular, and, and others, Wimbledon and, and so on, Hammersmith. Um, so just to revert there to your previous question, because I see somebody asking a question on screen or saying that they knew many people who were in trade unions. And yes, um, this is the case in, 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 in the 60s in um, the building industry per se. Um, and there was a famous um, strike at the Shell Centre, which was a McAlpine site, a huge site. Uh, and it was organised by the Communist Party, uh, with Brian Behan being a, a prime mover in the in the uh, in the activity. Um, and there was a yeah, they they, they basically they, they shut down the site and they they hired uh, rehired people. But um, that was trade union activity, and there was trade union activity amongst the tradesmen. Seal fixers, for example, were unionised, and uh, as I say, I know electricians were unionised. Um, um, plant operators to to a degree, yes. So it, the, the industry evolved over that period, those those decades, forties, uh, fifties, uh, through the seventies, and it's, it's has evolved to the point where there's it has bears no resemblance, uh, really, to to the industry, uh, to the modern industry. There's no resemblance to, to the industries of the past, uh, in in many respects. As I said about like you you, you can't go on site without having you know tickets for this, that, and the other. That prove you know what you're doing and health and safety is a major a major issue i mean in the railway i see deaths per mile of railway was considered um, unremarkable that was uh, just an acceptable uh, rate of attrition so um, i can't uh, can't be definitive uh, over the entire uh, period that i've written about which was from the 18 1880s 1890s right to the 1990s uh, no no one size doesn't fit all but yeah, to go to come back to your your point there, Zibi, about the how did they link up? Well, as I say, they went from the known to the known. They'd be given maybe you know and 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 that applies to the, to the girls too, to the women. And in, in at some point, some points, at some period, more women than men left. Um, they left young, single, and alone, as as the phrase has it. But they would be given under an address. You know, go to you know such and such an address. Um, a neighbour of mine uh, has is in digs there. He might be, you know, able to uh, get you the start. Or uh, Auntie So and So lives in such a place. She'll give you a bed for the night. Or go to the Crown and they might let you crash out upstairs for a few nights and give you the feed until you get the start. That kind of way. And then when the Irish centres per se kicked in, um, they were obviously a, a, a magnet and an invaluable resource. Thank you. Can you talk um, Utten, a bit about the movement backwards and forwards between islands? So people um, migrated from Ireland and came and found work in, in um, Britain. And um, was there much? Were there many return trips? Did people have the chance to go back and see family? Did people go back to live in Ireland? What was the, the traffic like backwards and forwards in the construction? Industry? I think the difference between uh, emigrating to Britain and emigrating to um, America was that. To get to America, you needed courage, cash, and contacts. To get to England, you needed 30 shillings to get you to Houston. That was it. So, you know, 30 bob wasn't hard to come by. And uh, likewise, <clears throat> you'd be able to lay your hands on us to go back again. The, the, and so there was a sense that, you know, there was more, the, the, the emigrant to the United States was more worthy of respect and um, because they had had to plan and and uh, organize themselves and get their act together, whereas you know you could go off to 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 England on a whim, 
you know, and the assumption was, well, you'd come back on a whim likewise. No, because the very fact that it was so easy to go uh, meant that you would be criticised for um, coming back, you know, or as, as, as one man put it to me, if, um, if a taxi drew up, and this was over there in, in near Kilrush, if a taxi drew up and a fella got out and two suitcases were taken out of the boot, ah, now there's the lad, he made it. He said you could leave on the bus, but if you came back on the bus, <laughs> you know, <laughs> questions would be asked. Um, and I, I, I left at 15. Uh, I was a boy entrant in the Royal Air Force in 1961. And I used to get, um, you know, um, a travel voucher to go on leave every few weeks. I mean, we were uh, we were men, but we weren't men. And so the service sort of understood that and they'd let you, you know, give you leave fairly frequently so you could go home, visit your parents or whatever um, in all seasons. And then later, um, being a dub, because the, the boat was handy to me and I went backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. Um, for, 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 for many years at, at perhaps less frequent intervals. So there was there was huge traffic. In fact, um, part of the reason that I ended up doing this work was because uh, in, in I, I went in my mid-twenties to, uh, to university as a mature student in, in, in Essex and uh, I paid my way through my primary degree working as a landscaper. So I do know how to borrow muck, even though I'm a, a little dub. As somebody said, the, the little quick walk of the dub is great behind the bar, but not much bloody good on a building site. <laughs> Brilliant. But, um, yeah, where was I? Yeah, and, and yeah. back in Ireland, anyway, and then I did a master's and then I came back to Ireland. And in, in, in the mid 80s, I came across a book Second-hand copy in in, 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 in in an old bookstore called um, An Irish Navvy by Donald McAulig. It was written mm -hmm. in Irish first as Deal and Jory, Diary of an Exile. And he writes about going over in the early 50s and he based in Northampton. And um, the world he describes then was, was uh, recognisable to me, even though my experience was in the 60s. I remember seeing, um, getting on the, the, the Irish... Um, the Irish Mail, wasn't it called, uh, out of Euston, the, 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 the train that went up to Hollyhead. And um, you'd be sitting there and you'd see these lads walking up through the, through the corridors as the, as the train got up, uh, you know, ahead of steam, and they'd have the bottles of stout and be <laughs> an endless procession of them. Go down to the bar, get the bottles of stout, back to where their seats were and they were drinking. Then they'd get on the boat then and you'd be downstairs in these with the Cambria or the uh, Princess Maud um, and... and uh, down in the bar and somebody would pull out a, a tin whistle or a concertina and a little bit of a tune, strike up a tune and uh, there'd be some singing and maybe a lad would jump up. This was in, when they, in, in the days when everybody would say they wore suits and they were big wide trousers, 16 inch trouser leg. And you see this big tall rangy Connemara man and he'd cut a few steps of the, the, the Shan nose dancing, you know, uh, and, and then he'd get kind of uh, all shy and confused and he'd sit down again. But it was great. It was a marvellous atmosphere. And then in the morning, as the boat would be pulling into Dunleary, you'd go down to the washroom. And you see all these big, powerful men with the, the strip to the vests and the braces down around their hips. And they'd be shaving. And then they'd be out with the, with the comb and the brill cream, and these, you know, to get on the bus to Ballina or whatever. And it was a marvellous atmosphere. But when I read that book, I said, Jesus, I, I remember seeing that going on. I remember these men. Now, I was, as I say, I was a... Uh, a short arse dub and, and, and I kept well away from Camden Town. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have had the stamina for the crack in Cricklewood the way these lads lived. Um, but I, I had my eyes and ears open and I had had my training as, as a historian by this stage and I, I looked at this, uh, this account and I thought, this is the 1980s. This is a vanishing breed and this way of life is, is all but gone. But it still took me seven or eight years before I could organise to, to begin research on, on, on the history of the Irish Navy and the history of the Irish and British construction. And by that time, really, uh, you know, all these things had changed. You didn't have those. You had car ferries now with, you know, massive great things with stabilisers and you didn't, everybody wasn't throwing up all over the place. You weren't, you know, tripping up on uh, beer and porter and... Uh, various unspe unspeakable things in the, in the corridors or sleeping out on the decks. All that had vanished and um, there was only a residue left. So that's why I set out to, to try and uh, reach people and talk to them. And uh, in, in part, I think I was lucky because 
of the checkered uh, career I had had myself that um, I'd seen the two days. You know, I wasn't a fresh-faced kid out of college, you know, with, with uh, everything laid out for me. Um, I understood to some degree where they were coming from, and I made it my business to find out um, as much as I could about about a way of life and a, and a world that I, I really didn't know at first hand. And uh, that's how I've ended up <laughs> being a bore on the navvies ever since. You know. Can I ask, Alton, about remittances? Yeah. Um, the importance, you know, how much they sent home, but the importance of those remittances, both to the family and to the national economy. I can't speak for the national economy, except in the sense that, um, and it's a very interesting statistic, you know, I said 82% of, of the immigrants in a certain, a certain period had left school before the age of 14 because they, the parents couldn't afford to, to get them in further education. Um, I've lost my point now. Yeah, reminiscences. Uh, 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 reminiscences. Remittance. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, they were expected to send the money home with no, with no, you know, not being equipped to do so. Goodbye, Johnny Deere, and send me all you can, you know. And uh, by and large, they honoured that, uh, which I think was a very unjust and unfair moral obligation that was laid on them. You know, and uh, as one woman put it very f famous, uh, famously, um, after 40 years in Britain, they taught us to hate England and then they sent us over here. You know, but uh, the, the half million left in the 50s, left with these obligations and no, no training or, or, or resources to, to deliver on them uh, and expectations. The half million who left in the 80s, the Ryanair generation, left with an education. They left wearing the same clothes from the same high street stores as the chains as their English counterparts. They listened to the same music. They followed the same football teams. They were indistinguishable from them and they were equipped to compete with them and to, to, to um, make careers for themselves. And sometimes they did in fair play, but they had no obligation to send money back. But there was a huge mm -hmm. expectation uh, on, 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 and uh, um, Patrick McGill, in Children of the Dead End, he, he loses it at a certain point and he says his mother kept writing to him and he was labouring around Scotland. Um, send more money home, you have another little brother. And he was saying, what did they think? That, you know, did they think this is, this is God's work? Did they think they've got nothing to do with it? More mouths to feed and I'm expected to, to, to maintain them and compete with the dogs in the, in, in the street for, for, uh, for a crust here, you know? Um, you could look at it that way. You could say that they were bred for emigration and that they were, they were also bred uh, as a, um, an insurance policy, a pension plan. You know, mm. you could mm. if you chose to. Um, and, and again, you can't, no, no one size doesn't fit all by any means. So I'm not the, the be all and end all authority on this. I've just steeped myself in it and uh, I know what I know, but I don't know everything by any means. But it was very important, yes, now to come back to, sorry Mary, to come back to the point about the contribution to the national economy. In 1960, the education budget here was 16 million pounds. Emigrants remittances in 1960 were 15.5 million pounds. So mm -hmm. the 82% who didn't get an education were sending money back to educate others who were getting uh, their big slice of the cake and that the others were written off and forgotten about, as you well know. Only the church, ironically enough, took any interest in the fate of immigrants in this country, in Britain, mm. sorry, in, in, until the 1990s. Mm. Thanks, Alton. You're welcome. Alton, could you tell us a bit about how people kept their mon money? Did people generally have bank accounts and how was money sent back? Was it physically well, sent on the boat with somebody or how, how was money transferred back to Ireland? Well, if, 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 if they held on to the money long enough, um, the money would go back um, in, the, in the form of the, um, it, was, it was a money order. She went to the post office, you know, and, 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 and that was redeemable in an Irish post office. Um, and it was well known that um, the postman would be watched. You know, you'd have a you'd have a road winding around the valley, up, up both sides of the valley, and you'd have you know, people would be out on Saturday morning, especially watching the postman to see what house did he stop at, and what house did he not stop at. You know, mm -hmm. and the house he stopped at, 
you'd see that woman later on then the bicycle would come out and the, the overcoat would be on and she'd wheel down into the town and in Elfin in Roscommon for example even in the 1970s I saw butcher shops open at 10 o'clock on a Saturday night why? because that was where the the, 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 the money had been redeemed and they were getting the, the Sunday the Sunday dinner <laughs> mm-hmm. you know um, but but um, sorry I lost my I keep losing my point I'm getting old you know no, not at all. You were talking about how money, um, tra- yeah, how, how money how, was how, transported back, and yeah, <laughs> how it was. Yeah, yeah. Now, the 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 course, I'm I'm talking a lot here about the um, about the subbies in cut and cover work and utilities installation and so on and so forth. But the Irish were were big in um, the groundwork aspects of the entire construction industry and um, strips of the skin. With the darky fin down on the Isle of Grain, you had oil terminals, you had um, power stations, you had hydro dams, you had, had motorways, you had massive projects, and the Irish were ubiquitous across all of them. Um, so uh, there was a lot of money being made, um, but but uh, they worked alongside poles in many cases, particularly um, on the hydro dams. These were been Silesian coal miners, displaced persons after World War II. And if you look at the cover of the current edition of um, uh, my colleagues in Irish Navy, you see a picture of, uh, and I have it in my book, of a group of men um, having broken a hard rock tunneling record. And there is, it's, it's late 40s, 1949, in fact, and there are Irish and there are Poles. And if you look closely, you can distinguish which are which. Um, but anyway, the Poles had a saying um, the Pole throws away the pay packet and keeps the money. Paddy throws away the money. And keeps the pay packet. <laughs> the boasting of it. Look, look, look at what I got last week. You know, but the fun is gone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyway, again, it's, a, it's yeah. a bit of a cliche. Alton, could you say a bit more about how women fitted into the picture and um, that you, you're painting of the construction industry? Were there any roles for women? Did women take up roles within construction no. um, at all? And did um, did people bring their their girlfriends or their sisters or their families across? Did um, the, the men who came across and worked in construction, did women follow them? Or what kind of roles did women take on? What kind of jobs were they able to do? Well, by and large, um, I don't think married men did bring their families over with them, um, at least not in the early st- stages. And um, it wasn't unknown indeed for, for, for young men to be claiming for a wife and children back in Ireland, vis-a-vis the revenue commissioners, when they d- didn't have any, uh, that was uh, one aspect. But they, um, the, well, women didn't have any role in construction in those days, uh, no question about that. But um, if a man married, I think there was often uh, an attitude inherited from from. Irish uh, society where um, the man felt that the woman shouldn't need to go out to work, that he should be able to maintain her and maintain his children and she shouldn't need to go out to work. Now, that was a, a mixed blessing because it meant the women wouldn't have, uh, you know, the independence of having some money of their own. So they would try to, and maybe uh, the practical necessity would have dictated that they would uh, have jobs, whatever jobs they could get while maintaining the family and looking after their children and so on. Um, and the difficulty with the construction industry was the, as we've said earlier, the macho culture and the dependence on drink that could that could uh, go hand in hand with that. And so um, it became a, a bit of a a bit of a burden on 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 the women to the point where it was. Uh, there was an expression, two went to the altar, but only one got married. Married. Yeah. <laughs> and a point could come where the woman, by keeping uh, her, 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 her bit of independence and her, her job going and so on, when the children got old enough, she could stand on her own feet. And then it was a case of either, you know, you change or I'm out of here. And so some of these men could end up in rooms, as they say, in their older age. Mm. That was one of the pitfalls. Uh, beyond that, I, I I don't know really what to say about it. Thank you. And um, we're 
shortly coming to the end of our session. It's been very, very fascinating to hear so much. And I think there are probably many more questions and we encourage everybody, um, if you have questions that have occurred to you since listening to this, please do get in touch and we'll, we'll try to answer those. But I wanted you to just to reflect on um, the tone or the meaning of the word Navi, which um, gets mm. used. Um, and could you say a little bit about that? I know that um, some people like it, some people don't like it. Could you? Talk about yeah, that. that's yeah, that's a very good. That's a very good question. Um, um, nav navi comes from the word navigator, and navigator derived from the 18th century commercial canal system was laid out in Britain, and it was known as the inland navigation system. And so the excavators or diggers became known as navigators, and that got abbreviated to navi. And in the railway age from 1830 onwards, those skills. Um, the, the work was scaled up, obviously, um, by, by, by many multiples, and uh, those skills became um, highly valued and, uh, and very important and very valuable skills. So Navi was a skill that took a year to turn a farm labourer into a Navi, which is why 90% of the um, railway navvies in Britain were English, not Irish, because there was no, um, you know, the Irish was, was Rural Ireland, it was subsistence farming by and large, on, on little small holdings. There weren't really um, skills being taught and there was no off-farm employment. So you were at the lowest rung of the, of the ladder. Um, but that's the derivation of the word navvy. And that became a, a play, applied then to all um, labourers on um, public works, as they were known, or, or, uh, and then later on, on civil engineering and so on. And uh, it, it was dropped from the English um, statistical um, record of occupations uh, in 1960, officially. So navvy ceased to exist. But by that time, um, it had become, and of course, the navvies were an outlaw breed even in the 19th century. You know, the greatest contribution of the, of the Navi to the welfare of society was the supply of public drinking water, was where one 19th century commentator put it. But mostly they were treated as wild nomadic outsiders and, mm -hmm. and they were given more abuse than thanks. And that attitude carried over. And uh, indeed, um, there was a tendency to, um, to promote negative stereotyping of the Irish in, in, in construction, in Ireland particularly. And Navi was regarded to some by many as a term of abuse. And um, that was the case when I started uh, 25 years ago do, doing this work. And that's why I have promoted it as I understand it. And it's a, it's a limited understanding. And, this, and, 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 and the work of those men and their achievements and the, their, those who supported them. To the point where I, 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 I believe now and, and from the, 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 the reaction I get, the feedback I, I get, that it's no longer seen as a term of abuse, it's actually seen as a badge of honour. And I, we very much hope that that's the case. There was Father Owen Sweeney, who was the chaplain on the Spencer Steelworks project, a McAlpine uh, project at Newport in South Wales, from I think it was around the late 60s. And he said, I came to appreciate the inestimable value I came to regard them as the true nobility of society, humble, hard-working men who rarely complained about their lot. Now, I couldn't, I couldn't put it better. Oh, lovely! Thank you so much, Elton, and a very big thank you to everybody who's tuned in for this session live. We can see that we've had. Um, People, people here are joining from different parts of Britain, from Luton, from Devon, from London, from Manchester, from Birmingham, and all over Britain, um, from different parts of Ireland. We have people from um, Dublin, from Tipperary, from Donegal, from County Mayo. Mm, so a very great. warm um, um, welcome to our series of Thoughtful Thursdays. We'll be advertising the next one very soon. Um, and really, um, for Master Irish in Britain, we would like to um, put a shout out to anybody who has um, reminiscence um, stories that they might like to share and have shared across the Irish community. And also perhaps to people who may have things um, at home, it might be an old dance hall ticket or pieces of um, memorabilia from different um, 
periods in recent Irish history that you might like to photograph. We don't need the physical thing to photograph and send to us the Irish in Britain because on our website, we have a, a big section, a growing section on reminiscence materials to support yeah, um, very important, people yeah. remembering different periods in Irish history. And we'd very much be um, grateful for any material that you might be willing to share that could be posted up there. And it builds a bank of resources for, for the community, for future generations, but also for people to use with um, uh, um, friends and family now as well. So a very, very big thank you to Otin. I think it, it's been a really fascinating session, very um, thought provoking, very interesting. And the, the research that you have been doing is really amazing and as you say so important to to value oral history and the, the spoken word as much as the kind of um the, the published um academic research as well um so it's been really really a delight to have you and um, we encourage um everybody if you um have enjoyed this and want to listen back it's going to be posted up the recording on our website um and if you have friends family community members who um, we're not able to join today, but may be interested to, to listen. Again, that recording will be there publicly on our website and, and you're very welcome to direct them to it. So thank you so much.